Before we start, let's pray really quick. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you um, for your son who died for us on the cross, Father. I pray that we would have ears to hear, Father, that we would have our minds be open, Father. We would just come in with an open mind and open heart to um, just discover new things and discover the richness of your word and uh, what you have to show us, Father. This is your name. Amen. Um, ironically, actually, this quote is from a Mormon. He was one of the original uh, Mormon elders, turn of the century. He says, if we have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. If we have not the truth, it ought to be harmed. Can everyone see this? I want to not stand in the way. Am I in the way? Here, I will stand this way. This is going to be very content heavy. And it's going to be kind of a roller coaster. It's going to be a lot to cover. I may run over a little bit. But I think that this is, this is something I'm very passionate about. Because it's the defense and it's the introduction of this book that I hold so dear. But I hold it so dear for a very specific reason. Because I believe if I have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. And if I have not the truth, I want it to be harmed. I think we owe it to ourselves to look into the Bible to see. I would argue to you that no amount of faith makes anything true. No amount of faith makes Islam true. No amount of my faith makes the Bible true. That's the nice thing about truth is it stands on its own, regardless of what you think about it. It stands regardless of what you know about it, regardless of what you think about it. And it's there to discover. And a lot of times I think it's a very underused skill to have what's called apologetics. And apologetics is not necessarily a Christian term. You can be an apologist for Starbucks coffee. It's a defense of something that you're passionate about. So it's not necessarily a Christian term, but I think apologetics is knowing why you believe the things that you believe and what you stand upon. And I think it's such an important skill that a lot of times it's uncomfortable to talk about because either A, somebody doesn't know enough information, or they just are just don't have the time to look into it, honestly, is a lot of what happens. Um, one of my favorite verses says, Honor Christ the Lord's holy, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yeah, do with gentleness and respect. And that's what I hope to help you guys with a little bit, to have a little bit more of a defense. To know, when somebody asks you, why on earth would I believe a book that's 2,000 years old, that's been changed over years, that's been manipulated, that's been, you know, had things brought into it and things taken out? How can I believe in a Christ that, that died and how do I know that he was raised from the dead? And I think those are all very good questions, and they shouldn't necessarily stump us because we owe it to ourselves to not just say that I believe these things in my faith, but I know them to be true. One of the first things I wanted to start with, I like to bring this up in the beginning because it's, it's the New Testament we believe. And when you talk about textual reliability, if you were a scholar and you were looking at an ancient book, you want to look at a few things. You want to look at when was this book written? Was it written at the time when these events were happening? Was it written by an eyewitness? Was it written by somebody who lived 300 years later? I'd say point two is, how many physical copies do we have of this work? If you look on the, the table here, Caesar's not doing so hot. He only has ten copies that ever actually mention his name or talk about him existing. And there's a thousand years between when they were originally written and when we have copies of them. Which is kind of a problem, because we take Caesar for to be an absolute historical figure. You know, look at Demosthenes, you look at Pliny the Elder, Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is at the top dog, it's got 643 existing copies, and it has the uh, lowest years between the original and the earliest surviving manuscript copies. Anything under 200 years is considered to be phenomenal, truly. Because you think about, if you wrote things on papyrus, how much would survive 2,000, 3,000 years later. So bear that in mind, here's a handy dandy little uh, chart you could say. The bigger the yellow circle, the more physical copies we have. You could go to a museum and you could read them for yourself and you could hold them in your hand and say, this is the physical copies of Homer's Iliad. And a really important thing about this is the more copies you have, the more you can see the trains of thought and the problems that there might be with a manuscript. If you only have one manuscript copy of the Bible, for instance, you have nothing to stand on to say, I know this was the original work, I know this stands to be what happened, and I know this stands to be what they originally wrote. So it makes a lot of sense, logically, to have more 
physical copies, but also to minimize the length of time from when they were written and the events happened until when the copies that we have. So, this is going to be some audience participation. If you had to guess a number of how many physical copies we have of the New Testament, what would you guess? You probably know, so you can't answer. Okay, what do you think? 500 is the number to beat. Bear that in mind. Could be less, could be more. I hope it's not less. I'll give you a hint. If this scales it down a little bit, this might help you if we're thinking about like scales. Thousand. Thousand? Any more than a thousand? Any more than three thousand? Any more than ten thousand? Twenty-four thousand copies. Fifty-eight hundred. In unsealed uh, Greek and Latin, we have thousands in Ethiopic, Coptic. We have it all over the world. And the really important thing to me, the more number I think is a little bit even more important than that, is 40 to 70 years. John Myron's papyrus is to argue within 40 years of Christ's death, of, of the authorship of John. We have the entire New Testament showing up before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And there's very, very strong, it's not for this talk, but there's a very, very strong argument that the entire New Testament is written before that time. And we have the entire New Testament showing up 40 to 70 years after this date. And what really sticks out to me, and this might not stick out to you immediately, but these documents were written at the time when the people were still alive who saw Jesus, who walked with him, who saw the miracles he did, who saw him die or not die on a cross. You know, they were alive and they could have said oral tradition was very, very, very important to the Jews. And they could have said, absolutely not. Jesus didn't die on a cross. He had three kids and lived to be 80, you know. Or they could say there never was not a Jesus of Nazareth. Um, what I mentioned about the 24,000 manuscripts, that is a wealth. It is on, it's honestly, like, laughable, the amount of manuscript evidence we have to see the progression from 40 years all the way up to the late 1600s. And a lot of you have probably read the Da Vinci books or watched the Discovery Channel and you talk about the Council of Nicaea and how Constantine corrupted the Bible and he brought a lot of his extra stuff in and he, he added in that Jesus was the Son of God and he added in about the resurrection and it's been corrupted. What's really interesting is you can see from 40 years after Christ's death all the way up to the early 1700s Gutenberg Bible, it is absolutely 99.6% accurate. Now that's .04 is a topic for another time, but there's sometimes when it's handwritten manuscripts, you miss a letter here or there. You know, they spell Jesus and they miss one of the S's. You know, there's... It's really funny, actually, because when you read it, you can tell that the scribe was getting tired and you kind of like... like. But what's really interesting is, to bear in mind, if a Hebrew scholar made more than three consecutive errors on three different pages, so one error per page, three consecutive, it would burn the entire manuscript and start over again which would be heartbreaking to me, because you're writing it on, you know, this thick of papyrus. Every time they would write the name of the Lord, they would wash their whole entire body, and they would get a brand new ink, and they would wash the quill. I mean, they took it very, very seriously. So you say, that's, that's nice and good. Okay, but you can't rely on a single source. You can't say, oh, the Bible's true because it says so in the Bible. Well, there's a lot of outside sources. Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Ignatius, the Talmud, Josephus is one of my favorites, Jewish historian. He wrote the 21-volume uh, Antiquities of the Jews. <coughs> he was alive when Jesus was around. He was in Jerusalem for the crucifixion of Jesus. He is, as far as you can tell, if you were to pick what I would say an unbiased eyewitness who's a professional historian, Josephus really fits the bill. He was working for Vespasian and Domitian, and he was a professional historian. He wrote 21 volumes and six other works. About 95% of what we know about Caesar and like the, the reign of the emperors in the early Roman history is from Josephus. So if we were going to discount what he says about Jesus, we would actually have to go out and, and sharpie out all the textbooks as far as what you learned in high school, because we rely on him very, very heavily, and Tacitus, and Tony the Younger, for their works on ancient Rome and Judea. This is a table which I don't expect you to read, but it's just a few of the things that are extra-biblical sources. 
Josephus says he was called Christ. He had a brother James, who was a wise man. He performed supernatural feats. He was a teacher of truth. Tacitus talks about the persecutions by Nero. He was condemned by Pontius Pilate. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes, and this is well worth the read. It says, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth properly. He went over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things, and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. This is from Antiquities of the Jews, book 18. If you were to like think of any like non-biased source, like it's it's very uncomfortable for people that are that are non-Christian scholars. It's it's I would say incredibly uncomfortable. Because they love Josephus, but they hate this passage more than anything in the world. And I have read so many attempts to try and discredit it, and it's so funny because where he wrote it, it's in a passage where it can't be discredited. They, they've said so many things about, oh, well, maybe he didn't write it. But it's safe to say it's considered to be Josephus' writing. And this is something from an outside source where he's looking at it, and he has no vested interest to lie. He's not a Christian. Christians were hated. They were mocked. They worshipped someone that was crucified, which was the worst, most dishonorable death you could have at that time. And it really strikes me as... Oh, just surprising me. Um, I want to talk about the crucifixion, right? Because what's really important is, yes, we have a lot of these manuscript evidences. Yes, we have outside biblical sources. But if these events never happened, we don't really have a leg to stand on, you know? If we can prove that Hezekiah never existed in the Old Testament, if we can prove King David never existed, if we can prove Jesus never died on the cross, it doesn't matter, as I said, how much faith I have, it doesn't make it true. And I want to refresh our memory, especially with Easter coming up. On the events, I'm going to read from Mark here. So Jesus has been arrested in the garden. He was held um, actually in the basement of Caiaphas' house, traditionally where they would be held. It would be like the holding cell for like Larimer County Jail until you went before the judge in the morning. And it says, immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of their envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd, so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him, whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted the crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him, put his own clothes back on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled, I love that word compelled, because I don't think he really had like a choice in this matter, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place called Gotha, which is translated place of a skull, and they gave him wine mingled with murder drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them, determining what every man should take. Now I guarantee you, we take that story. It's absolutely true. And we're going to look into that, so we're going to dive right in. In John's account, he says, For then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. 
So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now, to put this in context, Pilate at the time was the governor. He had had a really big problem with Jews revolting. He had another, it's not the Jewish of the Bible, he had a guy, Judas, who took 2,000 Jews out into the desert, and they had killed Roman soldiers, and they were all brutally put down, but the word gets back to Rome, because Judea is a Roman province. And Tiberius was going to visit, and Pilate, at that time, he was known to be, history records him as being a very fair and just man. He was not Herod. Herod was pretty awful. <laughs> but he... Um, he is afraid because he does not want another uprising. And he knows Barabbas. Barabbas was one of the leaders of one of the rebellions. So by all accounts, he should have been crucified. And he just does not want to rest. And Rome literally said to him, there is a letter back and forth between Pilate and back to Rome. And they said, do whatever it takes to keep the Jews happy. So it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people were like, why, if he was a just man, would he pass this judgment upon Jesus? But if you see this, the uh, stone pavement in Greek is lithostratus, and it means the tessellated pavement. And uh, this is a painting of the place where they would have the Praetorian guard in one barracks, and they would bring out the accused before Pilate, and he would pass judgment upon him like a modern-day judge. And you can see the tessellated pavement there on the bottom. This is a reconstruction <coughs> of the Tower of Antonia. And this was one of two places where... Um, Pontius Pilate would be in judgment. There was this, and then there was the um, David's Gate. And he would, he would kind of alternate between where he was in the city. But he had his like quarters here, and he had his Praetorian Guard. And historically, it's been considered that this was the site of the Gabbatha, or the Lysistratus, the place of judgment. Here it is in reference to the temple. And what's really interesting is it's Passover. And the entire Roman guard was out, and they would always be in the Antonio Fortress. They built it next to the temple specifically to be the heart of the city and to keep order, basically. What's really interesting is where this Antonio Fortress used to be is now the convent of the Sisters of Zion. And in 1857, 1851, my apologies, they were redoing the foundations, and they dug down and they found a tessellated pavement. And what's really, really interesting is they see these granite blocks here, they can prove that this was the Tower of Antonia. These are Herodian blocks. It was built by Herod the Great. And for those of you who have a keen eye, I blew it up here. There's some things carved in the floor right here. You can see the grooved horse tracks. You see how the tessellated pavement works together. Well, this game is called Basilicus or Basilius, the game of the kings. Definitely not a squeamish game. It's not Uno. This game was played by the Praetorian Guard. And it's almost laughable how brutal it was. They would play with sheep knuckles. And all the new recruits in the Roman Praetorian Guard would play. And they would, it was like they would roll, and if they got a certain number, they would move around the square. And if they got around the square, they would move around this pie chart looking deal. Whoever got to the middle last was the mock king. He was clothed in purple. He had a crown of thorns put on his head. He was beaten and mocked. And then they tortured and killed him. And then they auctioned off his entire family and his goods. And they did it. For, for, like, to um, desensitize themselves for crucifixions, because they were in charge of crucifixions, and they were almost constantly at war. And this practice went on. I just can't even fathom being okay with playing this game. But the last person was the mock king. And Augustus said, finally, you can't play this anymore. It's too bad for morale. So he said, you can only do it to prisoners. Which is really interesting, because Jesus is crucified at that exact time. If you remember, it says... And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes back on him, and led him out to crucify him. It's details like these that really bring the story to life to me. You know, here is, we know historically what the mock king looked like. And it's one of those things that reaches out. We can't necessarily say that Jesus stood in this exact spot. But we know historically what happened at that spot. Here it is from Matthew. Same account. It says, Clothed him with purple, it twisted the crown of thorns, put on his hand, began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. 
Straighten on the head and read, spout on the and they worship too. What's really interesting is that mocked is the same Basilius. It's that reference to the game of, you know, it's probably a well known game at the time. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper. Just as an aside, we can't necessarily assume that Pontius Pilate was a real person. He was not considered to be a real person until 1961. He was considered to be fictional. Fun fact. They found this. It was actually a seat in Caesarea Maritima, and somebody had pulled it off the wall and made a seat out of it. And one of the reasons the inscription was actually kept, it's not very kept very well, but it's kept as well as it is, is because it was flipped upside down, and when they saw it, it says, to the divine Augustus, this Tiberian Pontius Pilate prefect of Jesus. So all of a sudden, he, he comes from a fictional character into existence. And that's something we'll see as we go through here. Um, it's the secular world always is guilty until proven innocent. It's the argument from silence. They say, if there is no physical evidence, this person did not exist. So I think it's slightly flawed, but it's interesting to see that these people were real people. This was discovered in 2012. These things are still happening. This is Miriam, daughter of Yeshua, son of Caiaphas, priest of the Messiah from Beth and Rehob. This is an ossuary, which is also called a bone box. It's my favorite term for it. After about four years had passed when somebody was buried, they would take all the bones and they would put them in these ossuaries. And they would only carve on them. You think how many thousands they had to make. They would only put names or put any kind of inscription for somebody that was wanted to be remembered, somebody infamous, somebody who had some kind of standing. So what's interesting is you hear you have Miriam, daughter of Yeshua, son of Caiaphas, priest of Messiah from Beth Emory. If you look at the end of Chronicles where David lists out the... Um, list of the priests for the Old Testament holy place and temple. He has 24, and the last one is the Order of Messiah, Beth and And we know that Caiaphas was from the Order of Messiah. But it's things like this that really make a link back to the past, where all of a sudden this person becomes a real person. Now this is my favorite, because this person really is kind of a two-bit character. Here he is. Simon and Cyrene, who's compelled to carry the cross. Um, they discovered this on the little cheat sheet, I can't remember the dates. In 1977. And uh, they were excavating a tomb, and they found this Alexander, son of Simon of Cyrene. People a lot smarter than I know how to look into the history, like historical names and how people were named from the places they came. And they put it at a 95% accuracy that this is Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross of Christ. What's really interesting to me is in Mark, he says, Siren, this is Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, he's speaking as if they would have known these people at the time. He's speaking like, you know, Joe and Bob. Like, you know, you know these guys. Like, they're, you know, they live over here on the outskirts of Jerusalem. He's speaking of these people as known characters. But what's really interesting is Rufus only shows up in one other part of the Bible, and that's in Romans. And we see who's absent here is Alexander. And I would argue that's because Alexander's dead. But here he is, greet Rufus, chosen Lord, and his mother, who's been a mother for me too. Here he is referencing this character again, who probably went on to become a leader in the early church. But it's characters like these that my faith does not necessarily hinge upon the existence of Simon of Cyrene. But when people who spend their lives as non-Christian archaeologists spend, you know, 30 to 40 years digging up these artifacts, and they say with 95% certainty, this was the son of Simon of Cyrene. It really speaks a lot to me. Um, here's a fun fact for you. You're going to get sick of these bone boxes. <laughs> Historically, we know that thousands and thousands of people were crucified. <coughs> But there is zero archaeological evidence of crucifixion. There is no, and you think about it, that actually would make sense because they're crucified on wood. The nails were reused. The rope was, you know, used for something else. And they were literally thrown in the ditch. I mean, their bodies were literally worse than scum. They were seen as, I mean, it was worse than like a pedophile. It was just like the absolute scum of the earth. As a citizen of Rome, you couldn't even be crucified. You were exempt. It took a very, very special crime of treason or, or something bad enough to be crucified, to be subjected to something that awful and that horrible and truly that humiliating. So 
it was kind of a problem for a while because here, like, well, we we believe that this happened, but as far as physical evidence, what do we find? 1968, they found in a tomb this ossuary. And it's Johannan, son of the crucified one. And there's two bodies in here. There's a man in here crucified, and it was such a shameful death, he didn't even get his own bone box. He literally was stuffed in with his son. They're like, here you go, just kind of live in here. And he's not even, he's not even named. But what we do find is his heel bone. And what's really interesting is there's two pieces of olive wood, one on either side. And they would actually put a piece of olive wood, or whatever wood they had handy, on the outside of your heel so you couldn't work your heel off in agony, so you couldn't get your leg off of the cross. They had driven this nail in so hard that it bent. And it's something I'm sure they couldn't have gotten out. I mean, it's, even if you pull it out, it's like, yeah, it's a spent. What's really interesting is the, the nails at the time, metal was so scarce that they were kept either as good luck charms or they were just reused. But here's a, no, a nail that can't really be reused. On his arm bones, they found nail scratchings right here in his wrist. And what's really interesting is his legs were broken, absolutely shattered, both femurs, right across here, bilaterally. And it speaks of, in John, I'm sure you guys remember this passage, but it says, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that that might be taken away. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. If you guys remember, Jesus is crucified on a Friday. And like any good Jew in the room, you should know that Saturday is their Sabbath. And the Jews did not want um, even people that were crucified. It was very taboo to have someone hang on a cross um, overnight, to be exposed overnight. So if someone's not dead yet, they would just have them break the bones. And so, as morbid as it is, here is the crucified one. He was about 20 years old. He was from a very well-to-do family. He did something bad enough um, that he was crucified. But thankfully, we are exposed to this because he was kept in a tomb of someone rich enough that it was a sealed tomb, a family tomb. And here we have, jumping out of history, this very example. Now, the really interesting thing to me is that the cross was... Paul speaks of the stumbling block to the Jews and the Gentiles in 1 Corinthians 1.23. He says, it is the stumbling block, and he says that for good reason. I mean, it was looked at like, it's like, it's like worshiping the electric chair. It's like saying, you know, this is something that we, we worship someone who was crucified on a cross. There were two things that just didn't match up in the minds of the Gentile and the Jews. And this guy, Sukunik. You won't believe how far you have to like go down. These things aren't easy to find. I mean, you really have to go digging. This was a very obscure um, Jewish archaeologist, turn of the century. In 1945, he excavated the Talpioth tomb on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And some of the problems with the tombs in that area is either they've been robbed, or with construction work, they end up destroying them, basically, because they run caterpillar uh, bulldozers over the top of them, and they fall through the roof. And a lot of times they destroy what was inside of it. So to find a tomb that's intact um, is a very rare thing. And he had the privilege of him and two other guys found a tomb that was intact. And the Jewish Antiquities um, Office gave them four days to excavate this tomb. Here's from the inside looking out. And this is looking inside the tomb. He found two very interesting inscriptions. This first one is Iasis. Iola, and then Iasis Aleph. In English, it's like Jesus woe. It's a, it's a term of mourning. It's a term of um, respect and reverence. And they hand carved these on the wall of the tomb. Around the entire tomb, they found four um, hand carved crosses in the walls, filled in with charcoal. And on the patriarch of the family, it's a family tomb. His ossuary on four sides had the cross carved into it. You know, this is, this is a Latin cross. This is not a Greek cross. This is the cross of crucifixion, and the, only the cross of crucifixion. And what's really interesting to me is that these coins and some other pottery that were found in this tomb date it to AD 43. 
which is 10 years after Christ was crucified. So here, 10 years after Christ was crucified, we have showing up people who are, are so reverent for the Lord that they would put a symbol of torture on their, on their tomb and say, Jesus, Iasis Aloth, like, we, we, like, mourn over you. It's like we put on modern-day tombstones, we say, in remembrance, and he was loved, you know, and it's like, rest in peace. And it's the same thing of, like, blessing over the tomb. But these people were alive when Jesus was killed. I mean, this is 10 years. This is, this is the same generation. This is not 300 years later. I mean, it's, it's astonishing to me that these people may have known Christ. They most likely would have been there when he was crucified. It was a very public spectacle. They probably either knew somebody or maybe were exposed to Jesus when he resurrected from the dead personally. I mean, they were there at least to know. The relevance of this just really hits me of like, here are these people that take this so seriously when this could be such a joke. You know, Jesus could have died and never risen from the dead. And they could have known that it was, it was a dead religion. It was another false prophet who had spoken all these wonderful things and crucified in absolute shame and never fulfilled the things that he said he would fulfill. But then 10 years later we have people with absolute revenant saying, this is our Lord. This is our tomb. This is where we want to be interned for the rest of our lives and we want to honor to Jesus. Now following that vein, and you read in 1 Corinthians 15, this is a really favorite passage of mine. The first Christian creed. I've split this up so you can see the cadence of it, but these are not Paul's words. He is quoting. He is saying, For I delivered to you as a first important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried. And he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to save us into the twelve. After that appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. No matter how hard you look, this is what astonished me, honestly. The most militant atheist scholars date this at most to four years after Christ died. This is a creed. It was the first Christian creed, and it was something they would pass to each other. And it's something they would memorize, and they would say it as a blessing upon each other and to remind each other of what Christ did. And they can date this, but there's, there's not, it's, it's not something that's up for debate. It's been settled by Christian and non-Christian scholars that they know that Paul is not only quoting, but he's quoting from at the most four years after Christ was crucified. And this puts it even closer to the crucifixion. Here are people who, without a doubt, were there. And they're saying, Christ died for our sins, and he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, if you know your history, going further in history, it was not at all a popular thing to be a Christian. It was... Like, very hazardous to your health. Under Nero, like, literally, like, he would light his stadium by soaking the Christians in oil and strapping them to a piece of wood and burning them alive as torches. And he would feed them to the lions. He was in no way friendly to the Christians. He was absolutely hostile. To see that there's people that believe this so much to put their lives on their lives says a lot to me. And one of the best examples of this, for someone who knows obscure Bible facts, this will be your time to shine, but in two verses in Acts 28, Paul's first missionary journey, he goes to Tulia, Tulia, little town right here, and his neighboring Herculaneum. This right here is Vesuvius, Pompeii. AD 79, um, Vesuvius erupted and destroyed Pompeii, destroyed Herculaneum, Paul is not far from there for seven days. He said he stayed there for seven days with the brethren, brethren and he was uh, well received. And this is approximately AD 55. Paul died in AD 64. So it's putting a date on things. Here is the town of Herculaneum as it was excavated, um, 1938. It's by the same guy, Sukunik. They excavated the town just like Pompeii, and they excavated as much as they could. And right here, in building number 13, they found something really astonishing. And it, it, it's something you don't really read about so much today, but it's out there if you look. They found a house 
And on the ground floor was a shop, and on the upstairs was living quarters. And there was the master of the house, and then there was the servant's quarters, and then there was a closet, and then in the back of the closet was another little room. And in this room was an altar, and at one point there was the cross of crucifixion on the wall. And he's a Jewish archaeologist, but archaeologists and historians have this they have professional credibility. I mean, they have to take their job seriously. If you read the report on this room, I mean, they measured everything. They looked at everything, and they tried to make the argument, maybe this was a table. Maybe this was used as a servant's quarters. Maybe that's where a shelf was hung. And they came to the absolute conclusion, they found candles in there, that this was a place of worship to the Lord. And if you look a little bit closer, there's nail holes very hastily put in the corner. And at one point, there was a wooden covering over this. And AD 64 was the height of Nero's persecution of Christians. I mean, the, the family that had this, had this at their peril. If anyone would have discovered this, they would have been murdered. I mean, the servants are coming and going. It's, it's, you can't really say who necessarily was the one worshiping the altar. But it can be seen that there was a covering over the cross. What really gets me is like... AD 79, they're destroyed by a volcano. And one of the Greek um, historians, his name escaped me, he said he was 15 kilometers away from this town, in the ocean, and he was getting hit by rocks. I mean, it was not like a peaceful event. It was just like Pompeii, but they got hit faster. And I like to think in my mind that the last thing The cross of Jesus crucified, being worshipped by everyday people hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. I mean, you talk about the spread of Christianity. And that's something I want to talk about is you see it early on, it gets all the way to Ethiopia. It gets to India. I mean, within 40 years, it's all the way out to Pompeii and Herculaneum. I didn't, there's a lot of things you have to cut out for talks of this for time's sake. But one of the coolest things I think is Pompeii, there's a brothel. And right next door to it is a house. And in the house it says the house of the Christians. And in the brothel, down in the corner, there's some graffiti. And it's two men that are very upset that their friend left the brothel and went to the Christians. And they basically have some very unkind words to say about their friend who went to the Christians. You know, it's like the spread of the gospel at that time, it was not something that was easy. It was something that was downright dangerous to believe in. But it was such a thing that was so compelling that they believe this is something that I would give my life for. And the argument I'll make to you guys is if Jesus did not die on the cross, and if he was never resurrected from the grave, why would you give your life for it? And even more than that, why would 11 out of the 12 disciples give their life for it? They all, apart from the Apostle John, died horrible deaths. They were boiled, boiled alive in oil, speared to death, crucified upside down, burned alive. I would not, I love you guys, but I would not die for any of you guys for a while. You know, if I knew, I wouldn't go to court and stand in front of a judge and say, oh, I know this to be true, let alone die for them. But here are people that are ris risking their lives, and we know the disciples died these horrible ways. The final example I want to show you guys, and honestly, it made me cry. Like, when I found this, like, I, like, I just bawled, because I'd never been hit by such a personal example before, I guess. And this is the Palatine Hill. This is legendary where uh, Romulus and Remus came. It was a founding of Rome, as legend has it. It's one of the seven ancient hills of Rome. It's actually the oldest continuously settled part of Rome. And through Domitian all the way through in Tiberius, it was the site of the barracks for the Roman garrison. So you think of the modern day military in boot camp, they're all living in the same hut bunch of guys there, a bunch of dudes, and they would all live there, and they would train there, and it was their entire garrison. And in uh, 1851, they discovered that there was a room that had been plastered off. There's actually two rooms that had been plastered off, and it had been turned into a, a um, uh, classroom. It had been forgotten for the centuries. And when they broke through the plaster in the back of the Palatine Hill, this is where the soldiers slept, and they ate, and they lived their entire lives, they found this graffiti. 
that says Alex Amenis worships his God. And it's without a doubt mocking the Christians. At the time, they believed that and they, it was something to make fun of the Christians of that we worshipped a God with the head of a donkey. I don't know the origins of it, but it's very well documented that they would make fun of us and say, if your God isn't even good enough to not be crucified, you know, then he's just he's something to be made fun of. And here it is for all of eternity, you know, written into the plaster. And I imagine this poor guy just getting mocked. I mean, just getting destroyed. Like, how can you believe this? How can you put any stock in a Savior that died such a shameful death? And next to this graffiti, in another hand, in a hurried little carbon, is this, Alex Amenas Fidelis, which if you know Latin means Alex Amenas is faithful. Oh man, it just, it kills me. I like to think that he, or someone else, wanted him to be remembered for thousands of years after that as like, someone who never gave up. You know, like, someone who like, bore the, the brunt of like, his fellow soldiers mocking him and probably beating him and humiliating him. And he's like, I will not give up on war. And even if it means giving up my career, it means dying a horrible death. Like, this is something that means so much to me that I do not want it to be remembered. That even if no one would know what I looked like, and no one would remember me, I don't want them to be remembered as the person that the quit on the war. <coughs> I mean, it, it really puts into light pictures like these. I mean, I hope it really brings it into, like, a three-dimensional kind of view of, like, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says Jesus was in agony. He said, Lord, please, please take this away from me. Take away this cup of wrath. And he was in such agony that he sweat blood. And we didn't know that was possible, and this is pretty morbid, but we didn't know that was possible until the Holocaust. And the little Jewish kids would actually sweat blood because they were under so much stress because their parents literally murdered in front of them and they knew they were going to die. It was such a horrendous experience that your body basically gets overwhelmed and your capillaries burst and you can sweat blood. Well, inside of you, you bleed internally. It's not a good thing at all. And you basically turn into one giant bruise. And here is the Lord kept in the basement of Caiaphas' house. They traditionally, as, as historians have found, would hold you with your hands above your head and you couldn't lay down and you couldn't stand up. So you're kind of in like a half squat position all night long. I'm sure he didn't get any sleep at all. You know, he shows up to the Praetorian Guard and they mock him and they beat him and they ridicule him. And he's lashed and his back is opened. I mean, he, I mean, they didn't mess around. They would lash you with the bone and the, the, uh, the stone on the end of the leather that would go all the way down the back of your ribcage. I mean, he is absolutely in agony. And you just, you look at these pictures and you see, like, it was not in any way a pretty death. And it was not in any way, like, something that was, something that was easy. And my question to you guys is, what is your stumbling block? I mean, Paul at the time preaches, you know, that we have such a stumbling block to the Jews and the Gentiles. They say, you know, we cannot worship this man. You know, we, you know, he was supposed to come in and destroy the Romans. He was supposed to come in and be the warrior king. And here he comes in speaking about love. And he dies on the cross. I mean, if Alex Amenos and the people in Herculaneum can risk their lives at a time when it was not going to jail, it was being burned alive. You know, what is stopping you? He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment of God is peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. As Paul says here in Galatians, this is the last verse I want to read here. Galatians 6, 14, he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He says, may I never boast in anything but the cross. And to him, the fact that he's boasting, he's saying, I worship this Lord. I know that he was raised from the dead. I would stake my life upon him. And I feel like we've been cheated in such a way of like, 
In a way, we haven't been exposed to this. You know, we haven't seen, you know, the heel with the nail through it. And the absolute agony of going through this, this horrendous ordeal where you're naked on a cross in front of everybody. And you're slowly dying from asphyxiation. You can't get a breath. You can't push up on your diaphragm. And you're slowly just dying. And that's my challenge to you guys. Um, if you're interested in all, I would love to talk about it more afterwards. They are literally, this is a very, very, very small snippet of the wealth of artifacts and things that really bring this to into life. Um, something I really wanted to mention I thought was kind of interesting is, this is a recent thing as of 2011, but a team of geophysicists who are non-Christian um, were looking at it and they said that they, without a shadow of a doubt, proved that there was an earthquake that happened. AD 31 to AD 34 is the time frame. There's also really good historical evidence for the eclipse of the sun, where in the darkness when Jesus died on the cross. Those things for another time. Um, I hope this is helpful. I hope this is something that brings it to light and that we could preach the cross and not be ashamed. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to pray and close this out. Lord, I thank you. Um, Lord, I thank you for the things that have stood the test of time, Father, the artifacts that really bring, Lord, just really bring a three-dimensional, bring the stories to life, Father. Lord, I thank you for the Alex and Menace of the world that are always faithful, even in the absolute adversity they face, Father. I pray that even in the adversity we would consider you to be worshipped. And you remember that by your wounds we are here, Father, and we go out have some strength. Lord, I just thank you for your word that brings life. And I pray that uh, we just remember your sacrifice, especially the Easter coming up. I thank you for this time. Let's raise your hand.